Book two. Now the rest of the gods and men who were lords of chariots slept night long. But the ease of sleep came not upon Zeus, who was pondering in his heart how he might bring honor to Achilles and destroy many beside the ships of the Achaeans. Now to his mind, this thing appeared to be the best counsel to send evil dream to Atreus' son, Agamemnon. He cried out to the dream and addressed him in winged words. Go forth, evil dream. Beside the swift ships of the Achaeans, make your way to the shelter of Atreus' son, Agamemnon. Speak to him in words exactly as I command you. Bid him arm the flowing-haired Achaeans for battle in all haste, since now he might take the wide-wayed city of the Trojans. But no longer are the gods who live on Olympus arguing the matter, since Hera forced them all over by her supplication and evils are in store for the Trojans. So he spoke and Dream listened to his word and descended. Lightly he came down beside the swift ships of the Achaeans and came to Agamemnon the son of Atreus. He found him sleeping within his shelter in a cloud of immortal slumber. Dream stood then beside his head in the likeness of Nestor. Neleus' son, whom Agamemnon honored beyond all elders beside. In Nestor's likeness, the divine dream spoke to him. Son of wise Atreus, breaker of horses, are you sleeping? He should not sleep night long, who is a man burdened with counsels and responsibility for a people and cares so numerous. Listen quickly to what I say, since I am a messenger of Zeus, who far away cares much for you and is pitiful. Zeus bids you arm the flowing-haired Achaeans for battle in all haste, since now you might take the wide-wayed city of the Trojans. For no longer are the gods who live on Olympus arguing the matter, since Hera forced them all over by her supplication, and evils are in store for the Trojans. From Zeus, Keep this thought in your heart then. Let not forgetfulness take you after you are released from the kindly, sweet slumber. So he spoke and went away and left Agamemnon there, believing things in his heart that were not to be accomplished. For he thought that on that very day he would take Priam's city. Fool who knew nothing of all the things Zeus planned to accomplish. Zeus, who yet was minded to visit tears and sufferings on Trojans and Danaa, alike in the strong encounters. Agamemnon awoke from sleep, the divine voice drifting around him. He sat upright and put on his tunic, beautiful, fresh woven, and threw the great mantle over it. Underneath his shining feet he bound the fair sandals, and across his shoulders slung the sword with the nails of silver, and took up the scepter of his father's immortal forever. Thus he went beside the ships of the bronze-armored Achaeans. Now the goddess Dawn drew close to tall Olympus with the message of light to Zeus and the other immortals. But Agamemnon commanded his clear-voiced heralds to summon by proclamation to assembly 
the flowing hair decayings, and the heralds made their cry, and the men were assembled swiftly. First he held a council session of the high-hearted princes beside the ship of Nestor, the king of the race of Pylos. Summoning these, he compacted before them his close counsel. Hear me, friends, in my sleep a dream divine came to me through the immortal night, and in appearance and stature and figure it most closely resembled splendid Nestor. It came and stood above my head and spoke a word to me, son of wise Atreus, breaker of horses, are you sleeping? He should not sleep night long, who is a man burdened with counsels and responsibility for a people and cares so numerous. Now, listen quickly to what I say, since I am a messenger of Zeus, who far away cares much for you and is pitiful. Zeus bids you arm the flowing-haired Achaeans for battle in all haste, since now you might take the wide-wayed city of the Trojans, for no longer are the gods who live on Olympus arguing the matter, since Hera has forced them all over by her supplications. And evils are in store for the Trojans by Zeus's will. Keep this within your heart, so, speaking, the dream went away on wings, and sweet sleep released me. Come then, let us see if we can arm the sons of the Achaeans. Yet first, since it is the right way, I will make trial of them. My words. Then tell them even to flee in their benched vessels. Do you take stations here and there to check them with orders? He spoke thus and sat down again, and among them rose up Nestor, he who ruled as a king in Sandy Pylos. He, in kind intention toward all, stood forth and addressed them. Friends who are leaders of the Argives and keep their counsel, had it been any other Achaean who told of this dream, we should have called it a lie, and we might rather have turned from it. Now, he who claims to be the best of the Achaeans has seen it. Come then, let us see if we can arm the sons of the Achaeans. So he spoke and led the way, departing from the council, and the rest rose to their feet, the sceptered kings, obeying the shepherd of the people, and the army thronged behind them. Like the swarms of clustering bees that issue forever, in fresh bursts from the hollow in the stone, and hang like bunched grapes as they hover beneath the flowers in springtime, fluttering in swarms together this way and that, so the many nations of men from the ships and the shelters along the front of the deep sea beach marched in order by companies to the assembly, and rumor war. Among them. Zeus's messenger to hasten them along. Thus they were assembled, and the place of their assembly was shaken, and the earth groaned as the people took their positions, and there was tumult. Nine heralds, shouting, set about putting them in order to make them cease their clamor and listen to the kings beloved of Zeus, the people took their seats in sober fashion and were marshaled in their places and gave over their clamoring. Powerful Agamemnon stood up holding the scepter. Hephaestus had wrought him carefully. Hephaestus gave it to Zeus, the king, the son of Kronos. And Zeus, in turn, gave it to the courier, Argeophontes, and Lord Hermes gave it to Pelops, driver of horses, and Pelops again gave it to Atreus, the shepherd of the people. Atreus, dying, left it to Thyestes of the rich flocks, and Thyestes left it in turn to 
Agamemnon to carry and to be lord of many islands and over all Argos. Leaning upon this scepter, he spoke and addressed the Argives' fighting men and friends. O Danaan's henchman of Ares, Zeus, son of Kronos, has caught me fast in bitter futility. He is hard, who before this time promised me and consented that I might sack strong-walled Ilion and sail homeward. Now he has devised a vile deception hmm. and bids me go back to Argos in dishonor, having lost many of my people. Such is the way it will be pleasing to Zeus, who is too strong, who before now has broken the crests of many cities and will break them again since his power is beyond all others, then this shall be a thing of shame for the men hereafter to be told that so strong, so great a host of Achaeans carried on and fought in vain a war that was useless against men fewer than they, with no accomplishment, shown for it. Since if both sides were to be willing Achaeans and Trojans to cut faithful oaths, of truce, and both to be numbered, and the Trojans were to be counted by those with homes in the city, while we were to be allotted in tens. We Achaeans, and each one of our tens, chose a man of Troy to pour wine for it. Still, there would be many tens left without a wine steward. By so much, I claim we sons of the Achaeans outnumber the Trojans, those who live in the city. But there are companions from other cities in their numbers, wielders of the spear to help them who drive me hard back again and will not allow me, despite my will, to sack the well-founded stronghold of Ilion. And now nine years of mighty Zeus have gone by and the timbers of our ships have rotted away and the cables have broken and far away our own wives and our young children are sitting within our halls and wait for us. While well, still our work here stays forever unfinished as it is for whose sake we came hither. Come then, do as I say, let us all be won over. Let us run away with our ships to the beloved land of our fathers, since no longer shall we capture Troy of the wide ways. So he spoke and stirred up the passion in the breast of all those who were within that multitude and listened to his counsel. And the assembly was shaken as on the sea the big waves in the main by Icaria, when the south and southeast winds driving down from the clouds of Zeus the father whipped them as when the west wind moves across the grain, deep, standing, boisterously, and shakes and sweeps it till the tassels leave. So all of that assembly was shaken, and the men in tumult swept the ships, and underneath their feet the dust lifted and rose high, and the men were all shouting to one another to lay hold on the ships and drag them down to the bright sea. They cleaned out the keel channels and their cries hit skyward as they made for home and snatched the props from under the vessels. Then, for the Argives, a homecoming beyond fate might have been accomplished had not Hera spoken a word. For shame, now, a Tritone, daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, as things are, the Argives will take flight homeward over the wide ridges of the sea to the land of their fathers, and thus they would leave to Priam and to the Trojans Helen of Argos. To glory over, for whose sake many Achaeans lost their lives in Troy, far from their own native country, but Go now along the host of the bronze-armed Achaeans. Speak to each man in words of gentleness and draw him backward, nor let them drag down to the salt sea their oar-swept vessels. So she spoke, 
nor did the goddess gray-eyed Athena disobey her, but went in speed down the peaks of Olympus, and lightly she arrived beside the fast ships of the Achaeans. There she came on Odysseus, the equal of Zeus in council, standing still. He had laid no hand upon his black, strong benched vessel since disappointment touched his heart and his spirit. Athena of the gray eyes stood beside him and spoke to him. Son of Laertes and Cedosus, resourceful Odysseus, will it be this way? Will you all hurl yourselves into your benched ships and take flight homeward to the beloved land of your fathers? And would you thus leave to Priam and to the Trojans? Helen of Argos to glory over, for whose sake many Achaeans lost their lives in Troy, far from their own native country. Go now, along the host of the Achaeans, give way, no longer speak to each man in words of gentleness. And draw them back. Nor let them drag down to the salt sea their oar swept vessels. So she spoke, and he knew the voice of the goddess speaking, and went on the run, throwing aside his cloak, which was caught up by Eurybates, the herald of Ithaca, who followed him. He came face to face with Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and took from him the scepter of his father's immortal forever. With this he went beside the ships of the bronze-armored Achaeans. Whenever he encountered some king or man of influence, he would stand beside him and with soft words try to restrain him. Excellency, it does not become you to be frightened like any coward. Rather hold fast and check the rest of the people. You do not yet clearly understand the purpose of Atreides. Now he makes trial, but soon will bear hard on the sons of the Achaeans. Did we not all hear what he was saying in council? May he not in anger do some harm to the sons of the Achaeans? The anger of God-supported kings is a big matter to whom honor and love are given from Zeus of the councils. When he saw some man of the people who was shouting, he would strike at him with his staff and reprove him also. Excellency, sit still and listen to what others tell you, to those who are better men than you, you skulker and coward, and thing of no account whatever in battle or council. Surely not all of us Achaeans can be as kings here. Lordship for many is no good thing. Let there be one ruler, one king, to whom the son of devious devising Kronos gives the scepter and right of judgment to watch over his people. So he went through the army, marshalling it, until once more they swept back into the assembly place from the ships and the shelters clamorously as when from the thunderous sea the surf beat crashes upon the great beach and the whole sea is in tumult. Now the rest had sat down and were orderly in their places, but one man, Thersites of the endless speech, still scolded, who knew within his head many words, but disorderly, vain, and without decency to quarrel with the princes, with any word he thought might be amusing to the Argives. This was the ugliest man who came beneath Ilion. He was bandy-legged and went lame of one foot with shoulders stooped and drawn together over his chest, and above this 
his skull went up to a point, with the wool grown sparsely upon it, beyond all others Achilles hated him. And Odysseus, these two he was forever abusing. But now, at brilliant Agamemnon, he clashed the shrill noise of his abuse. The Achaeans were furiously angry with him, their minds resentful, but he, crying the words aloud, scolded Agamemnon. Son of Atreus, what thing further do you want or find fault with now? Your shelters are filled with bronze. There are plenty of the choicest women for you within your shelter, whom we Achaeans give to you first of all whenever we capture some stronghold. Or is it still more gold you will be wanting that some son of the Trojans, breakers of horses, brings as ransom out of Ilion, one that I or some other Achaean capture and bring in? Is it some young woman to lie with in love and keep her all to yourself apart from the others? It is not right for you, their leader, to lead in sorrow the sons of the Achaeans. My good fools, poor abuses, you women, not men of Achaia. Let us go back home in our ships and leave this man here by himself in Troy to mull his prizes of honor that he may find out whether or not we others are helping him. And now he has dishonored Achilles, a man much better than he is. He has taken his prize by force and keeps her. But there is no gall in Achilles' heart, and he is forgiving. Otherwise, son of Atreus, this were your last outrage. So he spoke, Thersites, abusing Agamemnon, the shepherd of the people. But brilliant Odysseus swiftly came beside him, scowling, and laid a harsh word upon him. Fluent orator though you be, Thersites, your words are ill-considered. Stop, nor stand up alone against princes. Out of all those who came beneath Ilion with Atreides, I assert there is no worse man than you are. Therefore you shall not lift up your mouth to argue with princes, cast reproaches into their teeth, nor sustain the home-going. We do not even know clearly how these things will be accomplished, whether we sons of the Achaeans shall win home, well or badly. Yet you sit here, throwing abuse at Agamemnon, Atreus' son, the shepherd of the people, because the Danaan fighters give him so much. You argue nothing but scandal, and this also will I tell you, and it will be a thing accomplished. If once more I find you playing the fool as you are now, Nevermore let the head of Odysseus sit on his shoulders. Let me nevermore be called Telemachus' father if I do not take you and strip away your personal clothing, your mantle and your tunic that cover over your nakedness and send you thus bare and howling back to the fast ships, whipping you out of the assembly place with the strokes of indignity. So he spoke and dashed the scepter against his back and shoulders, and he doubled over, and a round tear dropped from him, and a bloody welt stood up between his shoulders under the golden scepter's stroke, and he sat down again, frightened in pain, and looking helplessly about, wiped off the teardrops. Sorry, though the men were. They laughed over him, Happily, and thus they would speak to each other, each looking at the man next to him. Come now, Odysseus has done excellent things by thousands, bringing forward good counsels and ordering armed encounters. But now this is far the best thing he ever has accomplished among the Argives to keep this thrower of words, this braggart out of the assembly. Never again will his proud heart stir him up to wrangle with the princes in words of revilement. So the multitude spoke, but Odysseus, sacker of cities, stood up holding the staff, and beside him, gray-eyed Athena in the likeness of a herald, enjoined the people to silence. That at once, 
The foremost and the utmost sons of the Achaeans might listen to him speaking and deliberate his counsel. He, in kind intention toward all, stood forth and addressed them, Son of Atreus. Now, my lord, the Achaeans are trying to make you into a thing of reproach in the sight of all mortal men, and not fulfilling the promise they undertook once, as they set forth to come here from horse pasturing Argos, to go home only after you had sacked strong-walled Ilion. For as if they were young children or widowed women, they cry out and complain to each other about going homeward. In truth, it is a hard thing to be grieved with desire for going. Any man who stays away one month from his own wife with his intricate ship is impatient. One whom the storm winds of winter and the sea rising keep back. And for us now, this is the ninth of the circling years that we wait here. Therefore, I cannot find fault with the Achaeans for their impatience beside the curved ships. Yet, always, it is disgraceful to wait long and at the end go home empty handed. No. But be patient, friends, and stay yet a little longer until we know whether Calcius' prophecy is true or is not true. For I remember this thing well in my heart, and you all are witnesses whom the spirits of death have not carried away from us yesterday and before at Aulis, when the ships of the Achaeans were gathered bringing disaster to the Trojans and Priam, and we beside a spring, and upon the sacred altars were accomplishing complete hecatombs to the immortals under a fair plane tree, whence ran the shining of water. There appeared a great sign snake. His back blood mottled, a thing of horror, cast into the light by the very Olympian, wound its way from under the altar and made toward the plain tree. Thereupon were innocent children, the young of the sparrow, cowering underneath the leaves at the uttermost branch tip eight of them, and the mother was the ninth who bore these children. The snake ate them all after their pitiful screaming, and the mother, crying aloud for her young ones, fluttered about him, and as she shrilled, he caught her by the wing and coiled around her. After he had eaten the sparrow herself with her children, the god who had shown the snake forth made him a monument, striking him to stone. The son of devious devising Kronos, and we standing about marveled at the thing that had been done. So as the terror and the god's monsters came into the hecatomb, Calchas straight way spoke before us interpreting the gods will why, why are you are turned you voiceless, voiceless you flowing haired Achaeans? Achaeans Zeus of the councils has shown us this great portent a thing late late to be accomplished whose glory shall perish as this snake has eaten the sparrow herself with her children, eight of them, and the mother was the ninth who bore them, so for years as many as this shall we fight in this place, and in the tenth year we shall take the city of the wide ways. So he spoke to us then, 
Now all this is being accomplished. Come then, you strong, grieved Achaeans, let every man stay here until we have taken the great citadel of Priam. So he spoke, and the Argives shouted aloud, and about them the ships echoed terribly to the roaring Achaeans, as they cried out applause to the word of godlike Odysseus. Now among them spoke the Geranian horseman Nestor. Oh, for shame, you are like children when you hold assembly, infant children to whom the works of war mean nothing. Where then shall our covenants go and the oaths we have taken? Let counsels and the meditations of men be given to the flames then with the unmixed wine poured and the right hands we trusted. We do our fighting with words only and can discover no remedy, though we have stayed here a long time. Son of Atreus, do you still, as before, hold fast to your counsel, unshaken, and be the leader of the Argives through the strong encounters? Let them go perish, those one or two who think apart from the rest of the Achaeans, since there will be no use in them until they get back again to Argos without ever learning whether Zeus or the Aegis promises falsely or truly. For I say to you, the son of all powerful Kronos promised on that day when we went in our fast running vessels, we of Argos, carrying blood and death to the Trojans. He flashed lightning on our right, showing signs of favor. Therefore, let no man be urgent to take the way homeward until after he has lain in bed with the wife of a Trojan to avenge Helen's longing to escape and her lamentations. But if any man is terribly desirous to go home, let him only lay his hands on his will, benched, black, ship, that before all others he may win Death and destruction. Come, my lord, yourself be careful and listen to another. This shall not be a word to be cast away that I tell you. Set your men in order by tribes, by clans, Agamemnon, and let clan go in support of clan. Let tribe support tribe. If you do it this way and the Achaeans obey you, you will see which of your leaders is bad and which of your people and which also is brave, since they will fight in divisions and might learn also, whether by magic you failed to take this city, or by men's cowardice and ignorance of warfare. Then an answer again spoke powerful Agamemnon. Once again, old sir, you surpass the sons of the Achaeans in debate, or oh, Father Zeus, Athena, Apollo, would that among the Achaeans I had ten such counselors. Then perhaps the city of Lord Priam would be bent underneath our hands, captured and sacked. But instead, Zeus of the Aegis, son of Kronos, has given me bitterness, who drives me into unprofitable abuse and quarrels. For I and Achilles fought together for a girl's sake in words violent encounter, and I was the first to be angry. If ever we can take one single counsel, then no longer shall the Trojans' evils be put aside, not even for a small time. Now, go back. Take your dinner and let us gather our warcraft. Let a man put a good edge to his spear and his shield in order. Let each put good fodder before his swift-footed horses, and each man look well over his chariot, careful of his fighting, that all day long we may be in the division of hateful Ares. There will not even for a small time be any respite unless darkness come down to separate the strength of the fighters. There will be a man sweat on the shield strap, biding the breast to the shield, hiding the man's shape. 
and the hand on the spear grow weary. There will be sweat on a man's horse, straining at the smoothed chariot. But any man whom I find trying, apart from the battle, to hang back by the curved ships, for him no longer will there be any means to escape the dogs and the vultures. So he spoke, and the Argives shouted aloud as surf crashing against a sheerness, driven by the south wind descending, some cliff out jutting, left never alone by the waves from all the winds that blow as they rise one place and another they stood up scattering and made for the ships they kindled the fires smoke along the shelters and took their dinner each man making a sacrifice to some one of the immortal gods in prayer to escape death and the grind of Ares. but agamemnon the lord of men dedicated a fat ox five years old, to Zeus, all-powerful son of Kronos, and summoned the nobles and the great men of all the Achaeans, Nestor before all others, and next to the lord Idomeneus, next to the two Iantes and Tydeus' son, Diomedes, and sixth, Odysseus, a man like Zeus himself for counsel. Of his own accord came Menelaus of the great war cry, who knew well in his own mind the cares of his brother. They stood in a circle about the ox and took up the scattering barley, and among them powerful Agamemnon spoke in prayer. Zeus, exalted and mightiest, sky dwelling in the dark mist, let not the sun go down and disappear into darkness until I have hurled headlong the castle of Priam blazing and lit the castle gates with the flames destruction not till i have broken at the chest the tunic of hector torn with the bronze blade then let many companions about him go down headlong into the dust teeth gripping the ground soil he spoke but None of this would the son of Kronos accomplish, who accepted the victims, but piled up the unwished-for hardship. Now when all had made prayer and flung down the scattering barley, first they drew back the victim's head, cut his throat, and skinned him, and cut away the meat from the thighs, and wrapped them in fat, making a double fold and laid shreds of flesh above them. Placing these on sticks cleft and peeled, they burned them, and spitted the vitals, and held them over the flame of Hephaestus. But when they had burned the thigh pieces and tasted the vitals, they cut all the remainder into pieces and spitted them and roasted all carefully and took off the pieces. Then after they had finished the work and got the feast ready, they feasted. Nor was any man's hunger denied a fair portion. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, the Geranian horseman Nestor began speaking among them, son of Atreus. Most lordly and king of men, Agamemnon, let us talk no more of these things, nor for a long time set aside the action which the gods put into our hands now. Come then, let the heralds of the bronze armored Achaeans make proclamation to the people and assemble them by the vessels, and let us together, as we are, go down the wide host of the Achaeans to stir more quickly the fierce war god. He spoke, nor did the lord of men Agamemnon neglect him, but straightway commanded the clear-voiced heralds to summon by proclamation to battle the flowing-haired Achaeans. And the heralds made their cry, and the men were assembled swiftly, and they, the god-supported kings about Agamemnon, ran, marshalling the men, and among them grey-eyed Athena, holding the dear treasure. Ages, ageless, immortal, from whose edges float a hundred all golden tassels, each one carefully woven and each worth a hundred oxen. 
With this fluttering, she swept through the host of the Achaeans, urging them to go forward. She kindled the strength in each man's heart to take the battle without respite and keep on fighting. And now battle became sweeter to them than to go back in their hollow ships to the beloved land of their fathers as obliterating fire lights up a vast forest along the crests of a mountain and the flare shows far off. So as they marched from the magnificent bronze, the gleam went dazzling all about through the upper air to heaven. These as the multitudinous nations of birds winged, of geese and of cranes and of swans long-throated in the Asian meadow, beside the Caistrian waters this way and that way, make their flights in the pride of their wings, then settle in clashing swarms and the whole meadow echoes with them, so of these the multitudinous tribes from the ships and shelters poured to the plain of Scamandros, and the earth beneath their feet and under the feet of their horses thundered horribly. They took position in the blossoming meadow of Scamandros, thousands of them, as leaves and flowers appear in their season. Like the multitudinous nations of swarming insects who drive hither and thither about the stalls of the sheepfold in the season of spring when the milk splashes in the milk pails. In such numbers, the flowing haired Achaeans stood up through the plain against the Trojans, hearts bursting to break them. These, as men who are goat herds among the wide goat flocks, easily separate them in order as they take to the pasture. Thus the leaders separated them this way and that way toward the encounter, and among them, powerful Agamemnon, with eyes and head like Zeus, who delights in thunder, like Ares for girth, and with the chest of Poseidon, like some ox of the herd, preeminent among the others, a bull who stands conspicuous in the huddling cattle. Such was the son of Atreus, as Zeus made him that day. Conspicuous among men, and foremost among the fighters. Tell me now, you muses who have your homes on Olympus, for you, who are goddesses, are there, and you know all things, and we have heard only the rumor of it and know nothing. Who then of those were the chief men and the lords of the Danaans? I could not tell over the multitude of them, nor name them, not if I had ten tongues and ten mouths, not if I had a voice never to be broken and a heart of bronze within me, not unless the muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeus of the ages, remembered all those who came beneath Ilion. I will tell the lords of the ships, and the ships' numbers. Leitos and Peneleos were leaders of the Boeotians, with Arcesilaos and Prothoenor and Clonios, they who lived in Huria and in rocky Aulis, in the hill bends of Aetaeonos, and Skoinos and Skolos, Thespea and Graia, and in spacious Mucalesos. They who dwelt about Harma and Elezion and Eruthrai, they who held Eleon and Hula and Peteon, with Ocalea and Medeon, the strong founded citadel, Copai and Eutresis and Thisbe of the Dovecots, they who held Coroneia and the meadows of Halartos, 
they who held Plataya, and they who dwelt about Glisa, they who held Lower Thebe, the strong-founded citadel, and Onkestos, the sacred, the shining grove of Poseidon, they who held Arne of the great vineyards, and Medea with Nyssa the sacrosanct, and Uttermost Anthedon. Of these there were fifty ships in all, and on board each of these a hundred and twenty sons of the Boeotians. But they who lived in Aspledon and Orchomenos of the Minyai, Ascalaphos led these, and Yalmenos, children of Ares, whom Astuocheb bore to him in the house of Octor, Azel's son, a modest maiden. She went into the chamber with strong Ares, who was laid in bed with her secretly. With these two there were marshaled thirty hollow vessels. Skedios and Epistrophos led the men of Phocis, children of Iphitos, who was son of great-hearted Naobolos. These held Kuparissos and Rocky Pytho and Chrysa the Sacrosanct, together with Daulis and Panopeus. They who lived about Huampolis and Anamoreia, they who dwelt about Kephesos, the river immortal, they who held Lilaya beside the well springs of Kephesos, following along with these were forty black ships, and the leaders marshalling the ranks of the Phocians set them in arms on the left wing of the host beside the Boeotians. Swift Ios, son of Oileus, led the men of Locris, the lesser Ios, not great in size like the son of Telamon, but far slighter. He was a small man, armoured in linen, yet with the throwing spear surpassed all Achaeans and Hellenes. These were the dwellers in Kunnos, and Apoyes, and Kaliaros, and in Bessa, and Scarfe, and lovely Algeiae. In Throneon and Tarfe, and beside the waters of Boagrios, following along with him were forty black ships of the Locrians who dwell across from sacred Euboea. They who held Euboea, the Abantes, whose wind was fury, Chalcis and Eritrea, the great vineyards of Histiaia, and seaborn Kerinthos, and the steep stronghold of Dion, they who held Charistos, and they who dwelt about Stura. Of these, the leader was Elephenor, scion of Ares, son of Chalcodon, and lord of the great-hearted Abantes. And the running Abantes followed with him, their hair grown long at the back, spearmen furious with the outreached ash spear to rip the corslets girt about the chests of their enemies. Following along with him were forty black ships, but the men who hold Athens, the strong-founded citadel, the deem of great-hearted Erechtheus, whom once Athena, Zeus's daughter, tended after the grain-giving fields had borne him and established him to be in Athens in her own rich temple. There, as the circling years go by, the sons of the Athenians make propitiation with rams and bulls sacrificed. Of these men, the leader was Pateos' son, Menestheus. Never on earth before had there been a man born like him for the arrangement in order of horses and shielded fighters. Nestor alone could challenge him since he was far older. Following along with him were fifty black ships. Out of Salamis, Aias brought twelve ships and placed them next to where the Athenian battalions were drawn up. They who held Argos and Tyrans of the huge walls, Hermione and Asene, lying down the deep gulf, Troizen and Aeonai and Epidauros of the vineyards, they who held Aegina and Marses, sons of the Achaeans, of these the leader was Diomedes of the great war cry, with Sthenelos, own son to the high renowned Capaneus, and with them, as a third, went Euryalos, a man godlike, son of Mechisteos the king, and Sion of Telaos. But the leader of all was Diomedes of the great war cry, following along. With these were eighty black ships. But the men who held Mukenai, the strong founded citadel, Corinth, 
the luxurious and strong-founded Cleonai, they who dwelt in Ornei and lovely Araithurea and Sikuon, where of old Adrestos had held the kingship, they who held Huperesia and steep Gonoessa, they who held Pelene, they who dwelt about Aigeon, all about the seashore and about the wide headland of Helike, of their hundred ships the leader was powerful Agamemnon, Atreus' son with whom followed far the best and the bravest people, and among them he himself stood armored in shining bronze, glorying conspicuous among the great fighters, since he was greatest among them all, and led the most people. They who held the swarming hollow of Lacedaemon, Phares and Sparta, and Messe of the Dovecots. They who dwell in Bruseiai and lovely Algeiai. They who held Amuklai and the seaward city of Hellos. They who held Laos. And they who dwelt about Oetulos. Of these, his brother Menelaos of the great war cry was leader with sixty ships marshaled apart from the others. He himself went among them in the confidence of his valor, driving them battlewards, since above all his heart was eager to avenge Helen's longing to escape and her lamentations. They who dwelt about Pylos and lovely Arene and Thruon, the Alpheios crossing and strong-built Aipu. They who lived in Cuparisaes and Amphigeneia, Pteleos and Hellos and Doraon, where the muses encountering Thamiris the Thracians stopped him from singing as he came from Oikalia and Oikalian Erutos. For he boasted that he would surpass if the very muses, daughters of Zeus, who hold the Aegis, were singing against him. And these in their anger struck him named in the voice of wonder they took away and made him a singer without memory. Of these the leader was the Geranian horseman, Nestor, in whose command were marshaled ninety hollow vessels. They who held Arcadea under the sheer peak, Kulene, beside the tomb of Iputos, where men fight at close quarters. They who dwelt in Orchomenos of the flocks, and Phenaos about Prippe and Stratea, and Windy Enispe. They who held Tegea and Mantinea the lovely. They who held Stymphalos, and dwelt about Parhasia, and their leader was Ancaios, son, powerful Agapenor. Sixty was the number of their ships, and in each ship went many men of Arcadea, well skilled in battle. Agamemnon, the lord of men himself, had given these for the crossing of the wine blue sea their strong benched vessels, Atreus' son, since the work of the sea was nothing to these men. They who lived in Buprasion and brilliant Elis, all as much as Hermine and Myrsinos, the uttermost, and the Olenian rock, and Alasion close between them. Of these there were four chieftains, and with each man ten swift vessels followed, with many Epean men on board them. Of two tens, Thalpeos and Amphimachos were leaders of Actor's seed, sons one of Kteatos, one of Eurutos. Ten more were led by Amarunkeus, son, strong Diores, and of the fourth ten, godlike Polyxenos was leader, son of Lord Agasthenes, of the race of Algeas. They who came from Dulichion and the sacred Echinai Islands, where men live across the water from Elis, Megis was the leader of these, a man like Ares, Phileus' son, whom the rider dear to Zeus had begotten, Phileus, who angered with his father, had settled Dulichion, following along with him were forty black ships, but Odysseus led the high-hearted men of Kephalania, those who held Ithaca and leaf-trembling Neriton, those who dwelt about Crocoleia and rigged Agilips, those who held Zacynthos and those who dwelt about Samos, those who held the mainland and the places next to the crossing. All these men were led by Odysseus, like Zeus in council. Following with him were twelve ships with brows painted. Thoas, son of Andraimon, was leader of the Aetolians, those who dwelt in Pleuron and Olenos and Pulene, Caledon of the rocks and Chalcis beside the seashore. Since no longer were the sons of high-hearted Oeneus living, nor Oeneus himself, 
and the fair-haired Meliagros had perished. So all the lordship of the Aetolians was given to Thoas, following along with him were forty black ships. The Domineus the spear-famed was leader of the Cretans, those who held Knossos and Gortina of the Great Walls. Lictos and Miletos and Silver Shining Lycastos and Phaistos and Vruteon, all towns well established, and others who dwelt beside them in Crete of the Hundred Cities. Of all these, Idomeneus the Spear Famed was leader with Meriones, a match for the murderous Lord of Battles. Following along with these were eighty black ships. Heracles' son, Tlepolemos the Huge and Mighty led from Rhodes nine ships with the proud men of Rhodes aboard them, those who dwelt about Rhodes and were ordered in triple divisions, Ialisos and Lindos and Silver Shining Cameros. Of all these, Tlepolemos the Spear Famed was leader, he whom Astuocheia bore to the strength of Heracles. Heracles brought her from Ephura and the river Sele. Ace, after he sacked many cities of strong, God-supported fighters. Now when Tlepolemos was grown in the strong-built mansion, he struck to death his own father's beloved uncle, Lycumnios, scion of Ares, a man already aging. At once he put ships together and assembled a host of people and went fugitive over the sea, since the others threatened the rest of the sons and the grandsons of the strength of Heracles. And he came to Rhodes, a wanderer, a man of misfortune. And they settled there in triple division by tribes, beloved of Zeus himself, who is lord over all gods and all men, Cronos' son, who showered the wonder of wealth upon them. Nereus from Sime led three balanced vessels, Nereus, son of Aglaia, and the king Charopos. Nereus, the most beautiful man who came beneath Ilion, beyond the rest of the Danaans next after perfect Achilles. But he was a man of poor strength and few people with him. They who held Nisiros and Krapathos and Kassos and Kos, Eurypylos city, and the islands called Kalydnae. Of these again, Phaedipos and Antiphos were the leaders, sons both of Thessalos, who was born to the Lord Heracles. In their command were marshaled thirty hollow vessels. Now, all those who dwelt about Pelasgian Argos, those who lived by Allos and Alope and Atrachis, those who held Phia and Hellas, the land of fair women, who were called Myrmidons and Hellenes and Achaeans. Of all these and their fifty ships, the Lord was Achilles. But these took no thought now for the grim clamor of battle, since there was no one who could guide them into close order, since he, swift-footed, brilliant Achilles, lay where the ships were, angered over the girl of the lovely hair, Briseis, whom after much hard work he had taken away from Lyrnesos, after he had sacked Lyrnesos and the walls of Thebe and struck down Hystrophos and Munis, the furious spearman, children of Eoenos, king and son of Selepios. For her sake he lay grieving now, but was soon to rise up. They who held Fulake and Purassos of the flowers, the precinct of Demeter, and Iton, mother of sheep flocks, Antron by the seashore, and Pteleos, deep in the meadows, of these in turn fighting Protoselaos was leader. While he lived, but now the black earth had closed him under, whose wife, cheeks torn for grief, was left behind in Fulake, and a marriage half completed. A Dardanian man had killed him as he leapt from his ship, far the first 
all the Achaeans. Yet these, longing as they did for their leader, did not go leaderless, but Podarchus, scion of Ares, set them in order, child of Ephicles, who in turn was son to Phulakos, rich in flocks, full brother of high-hearted Protesilaos, younger born, but the elder man was braver. Also, Protesilaos, a man of battle, yet still the people lacked not a leader, though they longed for him and his valor, following along with Podarchus were forty black ships. They who lived by Ferrai beside the lake Boibes, by Boibe and Glafurai in strong founded Eolkos, of their eleven ships the dear son of Admetos was leader, Elmelos, born to Admetos by the beauty among women, Alcestis, loveliest of all the daughters of Peleos. They who lived about Thaumachea and Methone, they who held Meleboia and rugged Olidzorn, of their seven ships the leader was Philotetes, skilled in the bow's work, and aboard each vessel were fifty oarsmen, each well skilled in the strength of the bow in battle, yet he himself lay apart in the island, suffering strong pains. In Lemnos, the sacrosanct, where the sons of the Achaeans had left him. In agony, from the sore bite of the wicked water snake, there he lay apart in his pain. Yet soon the Argives, beside their ships, were to remember Lord Philoctetes. Yet these, longing as they did for their leader, did not go leaderless, but Medon, the bastard son of Oileus, set them in order, whom Rene bore to Oileus, the sacker of cities. They who held Trike and the terraced palace of Ithome, and Oichalea, the city of Oichalea and Elrutos, of these, in turn, the leaders were two sons of Asclepios, good healers, both themselves, Podaleirios and Machaeon. In their command were marshaled thirty hollow vessels, they who held Ormenoos and the spring Hupareia, they who held Asterion and the pale peaks of Titanos. Eurupylos led these, the shining son of Eoimon. Following along with him were forty black ships, they who held Argissa and dwelt about Gurtone, Ortha and Ellone, and the white city Olooson. Of these the leader was Polupoites, stubborn in battle, son of Perethos, whose father was Zeus immortal, he whom glorious Hippodameia bore to Perethos on that day when he wreaked vengeance on the hairy beast men and drove them from Pelion and hurled them against the Aethicus. Not by himself, for Leontes was with him, scion of Ares. Leontes, son of high-hearted Koronos, the son of Kainos. Following in the guidance of these were forty black ships. Gunels from Kufos led two and twenty vessels, and the Enes and the Perhaebeans, stubborn in battle, followed him. They who made their homes by wintry Dodona, and they who by lovely Titaressos held the tilled acres. Titaressos, who into Peneios cast his bright current, yet he is not mixed with the silver whirls of Peneios, but like oil is floated along the surface above him, since he is broken from the water of sticks the fearful oath river prothos son of tenthredon was leader of the magnesians those who dwelt about peneios and leaf trembling pelion 
of these Prothoros, the swift-footed, was leader. Following along with him were forty black ships. These then were the leaders and the princes among the Donaans. Tell me then, news. Who of them all was the best and bravest of the men and the men's horses who went with the sons of Atreus? Best by far among the horses were the mares of Elmelos, Fiery's son, that he drove, swift moving like birds, alike in texture of coat, in age, both backs drawn level like a plumb line. These Apollo of the silver bow had bred in Pereia, mares alike who went with the terror of the god of battle. Among the men far the best was Telamonian Ayas, while Achilles stayed angry since he was far best of all of them. And the horses also who carried the blameless son of Peleus. But Achilles lay apart among his curved sea-wandering vessels, raging at Agamemnon, the shepherd of the people, Atreus' son, and his men beside the break of the sea beach amused themselves with discs and with light spears for throwing and bows, and the horses, standing each beside his chariot, champed their clover and the parsley that grows in wet places, resting while the chariots of their lords stood covered in the shelters, and the men, forlorn of their warlike leader, wandered here and there in the camp and did no fighting. But the rest went forward, as if all the earth with flame were eaten, and the ground echoed under them as if Zeus, who delights in thunder, were angry as when he batters the earth about two foils in the land of the Adrimoi, where they say two foils lies prostrate. Thus beneath their feet the ground re-echoed loudly to men marching who made their way through the plain in great speed. Now to the Trojans came as messenger wind-footed Aris in her speed, with a dark message from Zeus of the Aegis. These were holding assembly in front of the doors of Priam, gathered together in one place, the elders and the young men. Standing close at hand, swift-running Iris spoke to them and likened her voice to that of the son of Priam, Polites who, confident in the speed of his feet, kept watch for the Trojans, aloft the ancient burial mound of ancient Isuetes, waiting for the time when the Achaeans should move from their vessels. In this man's likeness, Iris the swift running spoke to them. Old oh, sir, dear to you forever are words beyond number as once when there was peace, but stintless war has arisen. In my time, I have gone into many battles among men, yet never have I seen a host like this. Not one so numerous. These look terribly like leaves or the sands of the seashore as they advance across the plain to fight by the city. Hector, on you beyond all, I urge this to do as I tell you. All about the great city of Priam are many companions, but multitudinous in the speech of the scattered nations. Let each man who is their leader give orders to these men, and let each set his citizens in order and lead them. She spoke, nor did Hector fail to mark the word of the goddess. Instantly he broke up the assembly. They ran to their weapons. All the gates were opened and the people swept through them on foot and with horses, and a clamor of shouting rose up near the city, but apart from it, there is a steep hill in the plain by itself, so you pass one side or the other. This men call the hill of the thicket, but the immortal gods have named it the burial mound of dancing Murina. There the Trojans and their companions were marshaled in order. Tall Hector of the Shining Helm was leader of the Trojans, Priam's son, 
And with him far the best and the bravest fighting men were armed and eager to fight with the spear's edge. The strong son of Anchises was leader of the Dardanians, Aeneas, whom divine Aphrodite bore to Anchises in the fields of Ida, the goddess lying in love with the mortal. Not Aeneas alone, but with him were two sons of Antenor, Archelochos and Akamas, both skilled in all fighting. They who lived in Zalea below the foot of Mount Ida, men of wealth who drank the dark water of Isopos, Trojans, of these the leader was the shining son of Lycaon, Pandaros, with the bow that was actual gift of Apollo. They who held Adresteia and the countryside of Apisos, they who held Putueia and the sheer hill of Tereia, these were led by Adrestos and Amphaos, armored in linen, sons both of Merops of Percote, who beyond all men knew the art of prophecy and tried to prevent his two sons from going into battle where men die. Yet these would not listen, for the spirits of dark death were driving them onward. They who dwelt in the places about Percote and Prakteon, who held Sestos and Abodos and brilliant Arisbe, their leader was Aseos, Hirtakos' son, a prince of the people, Aseos, son of Hirtakos, whom huge and shining horses carried from Arisbe and the river Selles. Hippothos led the tribes of spear-fighting Pelasgians, they who dwelt where the soil is rich about Larissa, Hippothous and Pulaios, scion of Ares, led these, sons alike of Pelasgi and Lethos, son of Teotamos. Akamos led the men of Thrace, with the fighter Peiroos, and all the Thracians held within the hard stream of the Hellespont. Elphimos was leader of the Ciconian spearmen, son of Troidzenos, Chaos' son, the king whom the gods loved. Pyreichmes in turn led the Paeonians with their curved bows. From Amodon far away and the broad stream of Oxaos, Oxaos, whose stream on all earth is the loveliest water. Pulaimenus the wild heart was leader of the Paphlagonus. From the land of Ennetoi, where the wild mules are engendered, those who held Kuturos and those who dwelt about Sesamos, those whose renowned homes were about Parthenios River, and Cromna and Aigealos and High Erythinoi. Odeos and Epistrophos led the Halidzones from Alube, far away where silver was first begotten. Chromis, with Innomos the Augur, was lord of the Musians, yet his reading of birds could not keep off dark destruction. But he went down under the hands of swift running Iacidus in the river, as he slew other Trojans beside him. Forcus and godlike Ascanaos were lords of the Phrygians from Ascania, far away, eager to fight in the onfall. Mesthales and Antiphos were leaders of the Myonians, sons of Tolimenus, who was born of the lake Gugayan. These led the Myonian men, whose home was beneath Mount Tmolos. The Carians of outland speech were led by Nastes, those who held Miletos and the leaf-deep mountain of Hieron, the waters of Myandros and the headlong peaks of Mukele. Of these, the two leaders were Amphimachos and Nastes, Nastes and Amphimachos, the shining sons of Nomeon. Nastes came like a girl to the fighting in golden raiment, poor fool. Nor did this avail to keep dismal death back, but he went down under the hands of swift running Iacides in the river, and fiery Achilles stripped the gold from him. Sarpedon, with unfaulted Glaucos, was lord of the Lycians, from Lycia far away, and the whirling waters of Xanthos. <laughs>